Hi, we're here with a good friend of mine, Bob Akers, uh, incredible wing shot, and one of his other talents is in the kitchen. Come up with many recipes for wild game. He's going to share one of our favorites for pheasant that he's come up with. Bob? Okay, Ron, we're going to put on a whole pheasant dinner for you people tonight, and uh, we'll from start to finish, and we're going to tell you a lot about my theories on wild game. Hi everyone, today we're going to cook a pheasant dinner and uh, I have a lot of theories about wild game and we're going to try to explain some to you about my feelings of wild game and how they should be cooked. Pheasant is one of the hardest things to cook and to get right and uh, after many many years of cooking pheasant I think I've got it down pretty good. The major problem with pheasant and all upland game birds is overcooking. If you overcook them, they're no good. They get dry because there's no fat on wild game, not like a chicken or a goose or a duck. So we're gonna be careful, that's the most important thing. So to start out, whenever you do a recipe or a dinner, the base thing, if you've seen other cooking shows, is you get all your ingredients out, read the recipes, and know what you wanna do. If you have everything out and prepared, you don't have to think about, oh, I've gotta get this done, or I've gotta get that done. Everything is there at your fingertips. It makes cooking a lot easier. So the first thing, and another thing is timing. So the first thing we're going to do is we're gonna cook the thing that takes the longest for this dinner. And that's gonna be our rice pilaf. Very simple rice pilaf. And here's how we start. We take a, a cube of butter. I know it's a lot, but we're gonna make a lot of pilaf. And you melt it in a pan, okay? We're gonna start the burner. And what we're going to do is we're gonna take our rice and I like to use a converted rice like Uncle Ben's because it's, um, it stays separate. And a pilaf, you don't want a sticky rice or high gluten rice. You want something that's converted rice that stays, stays separated so they doesn't all stick together. Uncle Ben's is probably the best one. I'm not, I'm not plugging Uncle Ben's, but it's probably one of the best ones on the market for doing this. This recipe is not mine. It came from Narcy's Restaurant in Kensington. And uh, this was his favorite pilaf recipe and it's fantastic. So now that our butter is coming up to, well, not a boil, but it's getting warm, we're going to take a spoon and we're just going to, I'm using two cups of rice. We're just going to put the rice in and we're just going to start stirring it. And we're going to brown the rice in the, in the butter. Two cups of rice to a, a cube of butter. It's going to take a little while here. You can do it on high heat. And we want to do it until the rice starts to bubble. So rice, rice, like most recipes, they, they want too much water. And we want firmer, for firmer rice, I use one and a half to one, one and a half water or stock to uh, a cup of rice. And uh, so what we're doing today, we're doing two cups of rice a day, so we're using three cups of chicken stock. And you'll just come out with a much firmer separated rice than if you use two cups. It just makes for a better rice and a better pilaf for sure. You don't want your pilaf to be sticky. You want it to be separate and firm. All right, so now we're gonna, I'm gonna show you where we've got the rice nice and bubbly now. It's only taking a couple minutes. And it'll turn a little brown and that's okay. I will show it to you in a second. It's just bubbling really nicely. And the, the more you brown it, the nuttier the flavor. And I'm browning it on high. Now you can see how bubbly it is. Okay, so that's, that's where we want it. Now, I'm going to add to this some sliced mushrooms. And what happens, we'll, we're gonna brown those up a little bit too. And I'm not trying to cook them to death because they're gonna cook in the, when we put it in, the, we're gonna put this in the oven. We're just gonna brown them some more and the cell, the rice will keep bubbling. And at this point, it's still going to, uh, it's going to bubble, it's still going to brown the rice even more, which gives us even a nuttier flavor. And you can hear it sizzling. So that tells you it's doing a good job. And it doesn't matter, the mushrooms will just get mixed up, but when the dish is finished, the mushrooms will be on top because they'll float to the top as it cooks. Okay, we're good. So now I have three cups of chicken stock. You can use just plain water if you want, we're going to leave that there. But before I do that, I'm going to add the only seasoning we're going to put in this. And this is some turmeric. 
If you have the money and you don't care, you could add, oh, we're going to use, say, a half a teaspoon or so of turmeric. It's going to give it that real earthy quality. You could use saffron, and then it would turn your, your rice a little, a little orange, or yellow, I should say. And we're just going to mix this some more to get the seasoning, let it release the oils from the heat. You smell that turmeric, it's really nice, really makes for a nice peel off. Okay, now we're going to add our chicken stock. <clears throat> Just give it a little stir. <clears throat> Pardon me, a little stir. Now we're going to let it come to a boil. You don't have to stir it anymore. Just take a minute or two because the stock wasn't hot, but everything else was. And then we're going to cover it, and we're going to put it in the oven. That's a 450 oven for 20 minutes. And if you just do what I did, it'll come out perfect every time, guaranteed. Crank it up so we get that boiling going. In the meantime, I have a pot of clarified butter. And clarified butter is you just take butter and you put it in a pot and you bring it to a boil. The foam will come to the top, you let it boil a little longer, the, the bubbles will subside and they'll sink to the bottom. And what you have left is a, is a clear oil on the top. The reason we could cook with olive oil and butter or both, I'd rather use clarified butter, it's a better flavor, we, it just does a better job. So we'll just we'll use that to cook our pheasant in. And the reason you clarify butter is you get the milk solids and whey out of the way and you can cook with clarified butter at a higher temperature. You don't have to burn it. You won't burn the butter because you've taken what burns the milk solids out. So that's why we clarified butter. Okay, our rice has come to a boil. We're going to cover it, turn it off. We're going to put it in a 450 oven for 20 minutes. So in 20 minutes, it'll be done. Now, we're going to cook pheasant. This pheasant recipe, we're going to make a sauce. And what I've done is I've made a brown sauce. We're gonna use that as our base. And uh, you can make brown sauce ahead of time and keep it in the freezer. It freezes beautifully and it'll keep for a very long time. And it's nice to have on hand. You, any brown sauce recipe in any, any cookbook is fine. Okay, so we're, we've got our pheasant breasts and we've dipped them in unseasoned flour. You could season it if you like, but it isn't necessary. We're gonna lay them in the clarified butter. And this is the critical part or time of cooking pheasant. You can't let it get away from you. Now I have removed the fillet of the pheasant that's on the underside of the breast. It's called a little fillet. Those are for the chef because they're the best. So we'll just let those sit out there. All right, so this is not sticking. It's doing fine. All right, our pheasant's cooking away here. Nothing else in the pan. And I'm watching it. Don't be afraid to cut into it to see how it's cooking, or just, we're cooking one side at a time and watch as it starts to turn white as it comes up the side. You basically want this to be pink. If it goes to white, it's gonna be overcooked. So keep an eye on it, and because it's, it's also gonna cook on the platter when we take it out to rest while we're doing the thaw. Just starting to turn white on the edges now. And if you want, you can take a knife and cut into it to see how it's doing. I, I've done this so many times, I usually can tell by looking at it. Also, once we turn it, just by touching it, if it's firm to the touch, it means it's cooked through. If it isn't, it's gonna be spongy, it means it's still raw. Looking good. Now it hasn't taken very long, it's just a couple of minutes because these slices are not that big. So now we're just going to turn them.
after you get the clarified butter underneath the breast so it doesn't stick. Like it is. But it'll let loose in a minute. I've been heating my brown sauce, so when we start finishing the sauce, it'll be all ready to go, and it is. Just on a low, low simmer, just to keep it warm. Now, when I started this morning, I put some dried cranberries and dried, cher dried cherries in some uh, brandy. And we're going to use that in the sauce. So let's have a look at this pheasant and see how she's looking. I'm just going to cut into a piece. And spread it open and see how it's coming. A little bit more. It's done on the first side that we turned over. We need another minute or two on the other side. Now she's starting to break free. Almost got it. This is where it's most critical because if you overcook it, you're not going to be happy with it. It's going to be dry. So we'll just look at it again. A little bit more yet. Remember, I do not, I'm using a medium flame here, not a high flame, because I want to be able to control the speed with which it cooks and not have it get away from me. I'm going to cut into another breast and see how that's doing. We're going to give it one more minute. And that's it. We're taking them out. And I think it's been 20 minutes, so our peel off is done. Be sure to use the grip because that's a 450 oven, remember. And we're just going to sit it on the warming shelf. You don't have to open it. It's perfect. Don't worry about it. And it'll stay like that for a half hour while you're doing everything else. You don't have to worry about it. Now those pheasant are nice and firm, so I know they're cooked. Mm. So they're coming out, we're going to put them in a, on a platter, just to set them aside. Okay, and we're going to tin it with a little foil to keep them warm. I don't want to put them in the oven. I just want to keep them warm. <laughs> and we can just set them up on the warming shelf. Now, we're going to make the sauce. So the first thing we want to do, I'm going to leave all that good butter in there. We're going to deglaze this pan, but first I'm going to take the clarified butter and pour it over the shallots and mushrooms. We don't want to waste it. But we don't want to add wine to this hot butter in there and have it splash up on us. Okay, so now we're, we're deglazing this pan. That means you put your wine in, and you bring it to a boil, and you scrape all the brown bits, which comes from the flour on the pheasant, in the pan. There we go. We're gonna let that cook down a little, because remember, if, if a sauce tastes like alcohol, it's raw. It means you didn't cook it long enough to get the alcohol evaporated out. <sighs> and we're going to add a little sweet wine. I want it. Remember, most game sauces are sweet. Cumberland sauce, things like that, for venison and stuff. And I like a little sweetness. And that's why we're going to finish it off with a, with a plum preserve. You can use, I prefer seedless, but you don't have to. I prefer a, a, a raspberry. You can use currant, jam. Uh, raspberry preserves, blueberry, uh, not blueberry, but raspberry preserves would be fine with this, not strawberry. But we're going to use a, a wild plum preserve. Okay, we've got it down. We've reduced it by about half. Stick your finger in that. Taste it. And if, it, if the sauce isn't sweet enough, you can add sugar. 
Doesn't take much. It's just, it's a matter of taste, whether you like a sweet sauce or not. But we have more things to go in before we add sugar. I just wanted it out ready to go. Okay. Now I'm going to put in the brandy and cherries. That will soften them up, doing it on high. You might even get a little flame out of that brandy. Yeah, there we go. Woo! Get the fire extinguisher ready. Now when that flame stops, it means we've got all the alcohol out. And then we're ready to finish the sauce. So now, our brown sauce that we've had sitting on the side, we're going to give it a stir and we're going to add some, maybe a cup. That ought to do it. Put it back on the stove. And don't worry about it, we're through with it now. Now we're going to let this simmer and we're going to reduce it a little bit too, maybe by a third. And at the same time, it's still cooking the cranberries and the cherries. I've used, I'm not using a Bing cherry, I'm using a, more of a sour cherry. And just cranberries, dry cranberries. Oh, smelling good, smelling good. Excellent. Now, as we, as we put our mushrooms and shallots back in, remember there's more butter in that, and it's gonna increase the sauce. But my sauce is getting down there now, so I'm gonna add this the mushrooms and the shallots. And while I'm at it, we're going to have a, asparagus for a vegetable, so I'm going to put that on. And they're going to take seven minutes. We're getting our sauce ready to go. It's come up, and now we're going to sweeten that sauce and we're going to finish it off. And I like to finish it off with a little butter. And I'm using sweet butter, I'm not using salted butter. 70% of regular butter is salt. We don't need the salt, and we just want that butter flavor. All right, it's gonna, it's just the consistency I want right now. So we're gonna add, this is a wild plum preserve that I make. Like I say, you could use currant, jelly, raspberry, blackberry, anything like that. I don't like strawberry or blueberry, but yes. And that's where our, and just stir this in. It's gonna melt in. Just stir it down. Same with any of the jams, so they've got sugar. And then taste your sauce and see if it's sweet enough for you. If it isn't, you know that the tartness of the plum jam or the blackberries, it probably isn't gonna do it for you. Then just add a little bit of sugar. I want that all to melt in and get bubbly. I'm going to increase the heat a little bit. And then to make the sauce shiny, shiny, we're going to use a little cream and a little butter to finish it off. Can you hear it? Sounding good. Now we're going to add some cream. I'll start with maybe a quarter of a cup. That should be enough. Stir it in. Remember, if, this, if, the, if the cream started to curdle on, curdle on you, it means you cooked it down too far, and you can bring it back by just adding more cream. But we're not going to let that happen today. We're just going to stir it in. Got my temperature down a little bit. Looking good. And we're going to take a few pats of butter here, small and just melt them in, and our sauce is going to be done. Bon appétit, as they say. That looks just beautiful. It smells great. I'm going to taste it for sweetness. 
perfect. I'm not going to add any sugar. It's got a little bit of tartness to it, and that's going to be just fine. So that's done. I'm going to take it off the heat. Okay, and our asparagus is done. We do those for seven minutes, and I'm going to step out of the camera here for a minute because I have to blanch them immediately in cold water to stop the cooking. Okay, so we're ready to sit down and eat. We just have to plate everything. We're not going to plate it. I like to serve it family style so everybody can take what they want. So we're going to put everything in platters. But we're going to start with a salad. This salad is made with, it's very simple. It's simply made with uh, baby romaine lettuce. And I'm using, Narcy David had a citronade in his restaurant at Narcy's. This is a fabulous dressing. It's made with olive oil, lemon juice, Dijon mustard, egg yolk, salt and pepper. And that's about it. So we're going to mix it up. We're going to dress the salad with it. Not too much, it goes a long way. We're also going to use this for the asparagus. Toss it. I like to cut my romaine with a knife. I don't like tearing it. Don't ask me why, but I just like to do it that way. Okay, the salad's ready to go. We'll set that aside. Now we're going to, the asparagus, we'll take out and just set them in a bowl. Whoa, they're getting away from me. That should do it. And next is the rice pilaf. That handle might still be hot. No, it's okay. I want you to see how this came out. Okay, I said our rice pilaf was going to be perfect. Let's see if I'm right. Outstanding. See, your mushrooms are on top. And the flavor, the smell is just wonderful. So we're going to fluff it with a fork. You'll be able to see just how, how fluffy it is and how everything is really separate. It's got a good color to it from the turmeric. And that's it. This sauce is plenty warm and it'll heat through on the platter. Now I'm just going to pour it over the pheasant. We're going to decorate it with just a little bit of parsley, just a little and a little bit of fresh oregano, just for the heck of it. It's got a good, good aroma to it. And that is pheasant in brown sauce. Well, I can't wait to try it, Bob. Well, let's try everything. Did you get some sauce on? Yeah, yes, you have plenty of sauce on your asparagus. And Emily Post says it's, it's legal to pick them up with your fingers. So oh, just pick one up and try it. That. Remember, we did them for seven minutes. They should be al dente. Yes, they are. Oh my gosh. That sauce is just, it's the same thing as on the salad, but it really works for the asparagus too. And I'm definitely looking to try that rice peel off, but I don't know if I can hold off on the pheasant much longer. Let's try the peel off. Oh my goodness. See how separate it is? And the mushrooms are there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm. Just enough turmeric to give it that, that earthy quality. Mm -hmm. And I just got one of those uh, cherries that you cooked in that. Uh, oh, it was on the side. I'm oh sorry, I, I, I mixed it up. Huh? It was beautiful. Okay, so let's try this feather and see how she came out. to brag about my own cooking. But. Thank you, Bob. That work for you? This is a real treat. You go out, you hunt hard all day, and you come back and you have something like this to top it off. It just doesn't get any better than that. This is a wonderful meal and uh, good company. And thanks for sharing this recipe, Bob. Well, my pleasure.
one of the new videos I have coming out is going to be Never Lose Another Arrow. Now these are Axis shafts from Eason, bulletproof shaft. This is what I'm using for pheasant now because now it's a heavier arrow and it flies a little longer and faster. I'm, get, I'm able to tag my pheasants out 20, 25 yards. So I've done as far as 30, which blows me away. When I hit a bird 30 yards away, I fall down the grass and start doing like snow angels. I can't believe I did that shot. Um, but that's what these arrows do for me because they have the weight and the speed to get there. I'm gonna show you how we, why we paint the shaft. Carrie, a buddy at my uh, club, uh, came up with this. It's been invaluable for finding arrows. I'll show you how that works. Um, we use Luminox, which really brightens up, especially in low light. You can see it a mile away in the field, which is fantastic, helps you uh, locate your knock. The fe feathers I use, we'll talk about flight and why we use them. And I also put pheasant scent on my feathers before I go hunting. So if all else fails, I put my dogs on my arrows, they go through the field, they point my arrows. I've never lost another arrow. We'll show you how that all works. All right, thanks for watching, thanks for supporting. Remember to hit all the bells and whistles, all that kind of stuff. I think you guys know what to do. Subscribe, you probably already, hopefully you're subscribed. Thanks again for watching. See you in the field. We got a whole bunch of other videos. Um, uh, some of me selecting equipment, how to pick out a compound. I got a compound this last year, it was fantastic. Um, a Ventum 33 from Hoyt. Uh, fantastic arrows. I'll show you the arrows I got. Match one uh, uh, arrows that are just uh, incredible flying arrows. Uh, the accuracy is unbelievable. We'll discuss that. And uh, I've got a couple more videos coming out. Chasing elusive back tension. We're going to be covering that shortly. And uh, got a whole bunch of stuff for you. So you can check them out at Archery Only uh, or on uh, my YouTube site. We also got videos if you're interested in the pheasant hunting or just shooting aerial targets. We got a whole series of videos already up that show you how to hit targets out of the air, step by step. Uh, disregard the ad in the beginning of the video. We basically put a plug in there for the video for sales. We don't do it anymore. The video is for free. So just enjoy the videos, just skip right through that, get to the aerial targets and learn how to hit stuff out of the air to amaze your friends. Quite honestly, it's not that hard. If it was, I wouldn't be able to do it. And I'm pretty successful at it. So we're gonna show you how to do it. It's basically a lot of fun. Thanks for watching.